Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Financial Issues Forum featuring Diana Hendricks, who will speak on her book, Taming the Street. The full title is Taming the Street, The Old Guard, The New Deal, and FDR's Fight to Regulate American Capitalism. My name is Sri Chatterjee, Professor of Finance at the Gavili School of Business and the Gavili Chair for Global Security Analysis at Fordham University. On behalf of the Gavili School and the Financial Issues Forum, a very warm welcome to all of you. For those who are joining us for the first time, the Financial Issues Forum is a collaboration of three partners, the Museum of American Finance, the CFA Society of New York, and the Gabelli Center for Global Security Analysis at Fordham. Our goal is to bring renowned experts from many different fields throughout the year to speak on topics and issues that are relevant to the economy, to the market, and to you. In a few minutes, David Cowan, CEO and President of the Museum of American Finance, will give a full introduction for our speaker, who will speak for about 40 minutes, at which point she will address questions submitted through the question field that is located below the video player. Please feel free to submit as many questions as possible throughout the event. We will be addressing as many of them as we can uh, during the session. All attendees of today's event will be receiving digital copies of the book, Taming the Street, with information coming to you following our event. And now, over to my dear friend, David Cowan. Thanks, Sarish. I'm thrilled to be back with you and all of our friends for the fall season. And there's no one better to kick it off with than our good friend, Diane Enriquez. She has multiple books to her credit including a New York Times bestseller about the Bernie Madoff scandal that HBO made into a movie. And then in January of this year, Netflix turned the Madoff catastrophe into a terrific docudrama that Diana is prominently featured in throughout the series explaining the incredible events. Uh, I've seen it. it is definitely well worth catching and one of their most popular programs when it was released. Diana is an award-winning journalist. She spent 23 years as a staff reporter at the New York Times and has been a contributing writer for the past 10 years, uh, including an article earlier this month commenting on what Joe Biden could learn from President Roosevelt about financial reform. Diana has carefully researched Taming the Street, so much so that in the words of one positive reviewer, she has quote unquote, sweated gallons of blood to make it readable and succeeded by bringing her characters to life. To learn more about Diana, head over to dianaenriquez.com, where I was interested to learn that among all her accolades, she is proudest of a 2004 series explo ex uh, exposing the exploitation of American military personnel by financial services companies, and that prompted legislative reform and restitution cash reimbursement to the victims. I'm proud to say that Diana has written for our own magazine, Financial History, and she also is a member of the museum and a proud supporter for which we are grateful. It is my pleasure to turn it over to Diana Enriquez. Thank you, David. And it's such a delight to be back with the folks of the museum supporters, even if it's only virtual. Uh, just a quick uh, correction and a, and a little tease. My website is dianabhenricus.com, and if you go there, you can read for free the first chapter of Taming the Street. My thanks go too to Fordham's Gabelli Center and to the CFA Society of New York for their support for this series. Now, I don't often do this, as David knows from hearing me speak before, but I would like to open today by reading a short passage from Taming the Street. It's set in the days when, believe it or not, stock exchanges had half-day sessions on Saturdays. The characters are New York's Governor Franklin Roosevelt, Democratic candidate for president, and New York Stock Exchange president and staunch Republican, Dick Whitney. On election day, November 8, 1932, 
Roosevelt carried all but six states in a landslide that expanded the Democrats' power in the House and Senate and swept FDR's lieutenant governor, Herbert H. Lehman, into the governor's chair in Albany. But the Constitution, in language already repealed for future elections, required Roosevelt to wait until Saturday, March 4, 1933, to be sworn in. As he waited, the nation descended into the worst winter of the Depression. Parts of the farm belt were drying up and starting to blow away. Untold hosts of people were homeless or living in shacks made of tin scraps or old boxes. Photographs from the era show families scouring landfills for salvageable food or saleable goods. Others were painfully choosing whether to spend their scant funds on heat or groceries. Private charities were exhausted. Churches, museums, colleges, men's lodges, women's clubs, scout troops were all struggling as donations dried up. A record number of businesses had failed that year. Those that survived had done so by cutting millions of workers off their payrolls. At least 25% of America's workers, nearly 13 million people at a minimum, were unemployed. It is likely the national tally was much higher, and it is certain the toll in some cities was higher still. Democracy itself was being tested. In November, the nation had overwhelmingly elected a man who promised to help, but his hands were tied for months. It seemed the social order had finally slipped off its axis on February 15, 1933. At a Miami evening rally, an assassin fired five shots at Roosevelt, who was spared when an alert woman bravely jostled the gunman's arm. As the assassin was wrestled to the ground, the president-elect hauled one nearby victim, the fatally wounded mayor of Chicago, into his limousine and held him in his arms as they sped to the hospital. Afterward, FDR seemed utterly himself. His only visible reaction was his concern for the mayor and the others who had been shot. One close aide recalled, I have never in my life seen anything more magnificent than Roosevelt's calm on that night. There was worse still for the nation to endure before the inauguration. Days before FDR's miraculous escape, a major bank in Detroit, the hub of the nation's supposedly impregnable auto industry, had been hit with a run and was in danger of failing. A desperate Treasury official sought help from auto titan Henry Ford, warning him that the Detroit failure could be disastrous for the whole country. Ford refused. Let the crash come, he said. And it did. A desperate Michigan governor and soon governors in nearly every other state closed their banks or severely restricted withdrawals. By the time Roosevelt boarded his train to Washington on Thursday, March 2nd, consumer spending had virtually stopped. By late Friday evening, March 3rd, when he went to bed in a suite on the seventh floor of the Mayflower Hotel in Washington, only New York's mighty banks were still open. When he woke up on Saturday, they too were closed. Before dawn that morning, Governor Lehman had declared a two-day bank holiday at the pleading of the New York Federal Reserve Bank. The moratorium would last days longer. Stocks can't be paid for if banks aren't open. Dick Whitney had no choice but to close the New York Stock Exchange. Before the opening bell on Saturday morning, March 4th, He climbed up to the podium over the trading floor and announced the two-day closure, only the third in the exchange's history. Two days would come and go, but as long as the banks were closed, the exchange would also remain shuttered. It must have been a bitter pill for the man who almost single-handedly had kept the exchange open through the 1929 crash and the 1931 gold crisis. The trading floor was hushed by his words. The tickers sent the news out across the country and fell silent. 
like the great suffering nation, the world of Wall Street grew ominously quiet, waiting for Roosevelt. Taming the Street is set in the dramatic days when Franklin Roosevelt made the original case for regulating the cutthroat world of Wall Street, a world whose instincts remain as ruthless today as they were when FDR first arrived in Washington on the heels of the reckless Roaring Twenties. It's amazing to me that so few Americans today realize the key role that FDR's Wall Street reforms played in strengthening democracy and nurturing middle-class prosperity in the decades after the New Deal. Instead, it has become almost an article of faith for both political parties that Uncle Sam should just leave America's financial markets alone, cutting red tape, curbing bureaucratic meddling, freeing finance from Washington's roadblocks. These are the goals of deregulation, a benign term for a remarkably durable and to me, dangerous philosophy. Echoing the rhetoric of Calvin Coolidge's era, politicians of every stripe today have given lip service at least to the idea that federal market regulation is a burden, not an asset. Their ideal is an unfettered, unregulated market free to maximize profits for investors and raise necessary capital for American business. None of these politicians preaching deregulation today has ever actually experienced an unregulated American market. They have lived their entire lives protected by financial rules put in place by FDR almost 90 years ago. They have no idea what a market without a cop on the street would look like, how it would work, whom it would hurt. But Franklin Roosevelt did know, because he had lived through the 1920s. The Jazz Age is perhaps best known for the casual crimes of prohibition and also some great fashion. But it was also marked by the corrupt political spoil system and toxic output of unfettered industry. The decades vaunted prosperity quickly became narrow and top heavy with capitalists and wealthy speculators getting very much richer as farmers and tradesmen and unskilled laborers of all kinds struggled just to get by. Under three conservative Republican presidents, Washington basically let Wall Street decide how to behave. And by today's standards, it behaved like a criminal enterprise. Respected Wall Street insiders routinely manipulated stock prices. Widely admired bankers used deceit to sell foreign bonds that were almost certain to blow up. Financial titans formed Byzantine holding companies to control utilities and banks putting themselves at the head of the queue when dividends were handed out and at the back of the line when cash was required. They cut secret deals riddled with conflicts of interest to claim the lion's share in corporate bankruptcies at the expense of small shareholders and creditors. And they routinely traded on private information not available to average investors. They bought influence by bribing journalists and letting politicians buy cut rate shares of their richest deals. Some of that behavior was perfectly legal, but all of it was universally tolerated. Then in October 1929, America's, Americans watched in horror as an unregulated Wall Street collapsed. After a short-lived rebound in early 1930, the stock market began the grim decline of the Great Depression. By early 1932, the Dow Jones index had fallen almost 90% from its September 1929 crest as the nation's economy staggered almost to a halt. Amid widespread suffering, many Americans came to believe that only Uncle Sam had enough power to keep the reckless titans on Wall Street from wrecking the nation's economy again. Roosevelt ran for president in 1932 on a platform that unequivocally called for government regulation of the financial markets and tighter rules for the nation's big banks and giant holding companies. 
The nation that elected him expected him to act, and he did. The story of this unprecedented fight to redeem the soul of American capitalism, a story I think has profound lessons for today, is the story I tell in Taming the Street. The nation that went to the polls in 1932 was mired in what Roosevelt himself called a depression so deep that it is without precedent in modern history. Cog in the machine that law-abiding, liberty-loving America relied on to earn its daily bread and maintain civil order seemed to have broken in the Great Depression. Communists infiltrated peaceful protests by jobless workers, hoping to provoke police violence that would feed working class outrage. The captains of capitalism, fearful of a labor alliance with the communists, looked with growing admiration at the fascist leaders in Germany and Italy, who were dealing with their labor unions with deadly efficiency and undemocratic ruthlessness. The nation was balanced on a knife edge, ready to tip towards some dictatorial regime of the far left or the far right if democratic measures could not address the shattered economy. One perhaps apocryphal story from that era captures how precarious this situation looked to those living through it. Soon after his swearing in, a White House visitor supposedly told Roosevelt that if he could cure the depression, he would be our greatest president ever. But if he failed, he would be our worst president. Roosevelt quickly corrected him. If he failed, he said, he would be our last president. I decided to tell this story on the foundation of four primary characters. The most prominent, of course, was FDR, a son of wealth and privilege who came to champion the forgotten man, the vast army of Americans whose work had been taken for granted and whose needs had been largely ignored for too long. I also focused on two of FDR's most consequential allies in his fight to regulate Wall Street, Joseph P. Kennedy and William O. Douglas. For me as a writer, Joe Kennedy was a chameleon, a shapeshifter, a supporter of the New Deal, while still a brazen speculator on Wall Street. It's easy to make money in this market, he told a friend in the early 1920s. Let's we better get in before they pass a law against it. He grew rich as a market speculator and richer as a Hollywood deal maker. But as the depression deepened, Kennedy came to see Franklin Roosevelt as the only man who could lead America's desperate fight to save itself. He put his money and his media connections to work to help elect FDR, but their relationship would shift and sour over the years. If Kennedy was FDR's unreliable ally, William O. Douglas was the true blue sidekick who rode with him to the end of the trail. Douglas was a young Western-born law professor at Yale who had built an encyclopedic knowledge of the corrupt bankruptcy process. As a new dealer, Douglas shared FDR's contempt for Wall Street shenanigans. He was abrupt, sometimes abrasive, but he never fa faltered in his fearless support for FDR's financial reforms. My fourth character was FDR's fiercest Wall Street adversary, Richard Whitney. On an early day during the 1929 crash, Whitney had galvanized the market by striding from, a, from post to post loudly and confidently placing orders for tens of thousands of shares. Given Whitney's ties to JP Morgan, where his brother was a partner, his buying spree reassured panicky traders that the big bankers on Wall Street had gone into action to save the bull market. It was far too little and much too late, but that brief rallying campaign made Dick Whitney famous literally overnight. He soon emerged as the natural candidate to lead the Wall Street old guards resistance to Roosevelt's New Deal. Before his presidency was 100 days old, Roosevelt signed the first landmark bills that started to put his unprecedented regulatory agenda into action. The Emergency Banking Act, which dealt with the immediate epidemic of bank failures. The Glass-Steagall Act, 
which insured bank deposits through the FDIC and required banks to choose between serving depositors and underwriting corporate securities. And the Securities Act of 1933, which required those selling securities to the public to tell investors the truth about their business operations. Then, despite growing opposition from Dick Whitney's forces, Roosevelt won passage of the Securities Exchange Act of 1934, which created the Securities and Exchange Commission, the first federal agency ever created specifically to regulate Wall Street. The new agency held its first meeting on a blisteringly hot July 2nd, 1934, in a shabby old FTC building that stood where the elegant Federal Reserve Building now stands. The SEC's first chairman? Well, that was the wily Joe Kennedy, who had mastered many of the deceptive schemes the SEC intended to outlaw. His selection outraged many new dealers, but FDR correctly believed Kennedy's appointment would buy the young agency a little credibility on Wall Street and give it some breathing room. When new dealers protested, the president just gave a jaunty smile and said he had set a thief to catch a thief. Kennedy did not disappoint Roosevelt. In perhaps the most public-spirited achievement of his life, Kennedy quickly organized a functioning agency and staffed it with first-rate young lawyers like Bill Douglas, who led the SEC's congressionally mandated study of bankruptcy practices. With breathtaking speed, Kennedy quickly turned legislative language into regulatory reality. In 1935, Roosevelt pushed Congress further to enact the Public Utility Holding Company Act, which gave the SEC new powers to oversee and, if necessary, dismantle the unstable corporate pyramids that utility tycoons had constructed in the 19-teens and 20s. The bill also called for an SEC study of investment trusts with an eye toward regulating what we now call mutual funds. When Joe Kennedy stepped down from the SEC in late 1935, FDR tapped another of the original five commissioners, James M. Landis, to replace him. But at Kennedy's suggestion, FDR chose Bill Douglas to fill the empty seat on the commission, created by Kennedy's departure. Then when Landis returned to academia in September 1937, FDR chose Douglas as the new chairman the most consequential leader in the agency's history. Douglas arrived at his maiden press conference wearing a 10-gallon hat, a stained tie, and a rumpled suit. When he leaned back and swung his feet up on his desk, reporters saw a hole through the sole of one of his shoes. As they clustered around him, Douglas explained that he had a train to catch and then asked and answered his own question. One was, what kind of bird am I? His answer? I'm the kind of fellow who can't see why stockholders shouldn't get the same kind of fair treatment they would get if they were big partners instead of little partners in industry. He had no patience for monkey business, he said. It was exactly the two-fisted, plain-spoken approach that the patrician Roosevelt wanted his young market regulators to take. Soon, Douglas was a regular visitor of the White House with walk-in privileges at the Oval Office at FDR backed him in every confrontation with Wall Street. With Roosevelt's friendship and unfailing support, Douglas showed how aggressive government oversight could help produce a financial system that treated all investors fairly, one that could win and keep the public's trust. Under Douglas, many of the SEC's early cases became front page news and steadily public support for Wall Street's watchdog grew. In 1938, Douglas and his friend, Senator Frank Maloney, led the fight for passage of the Maloney Act, which allowed industry associations to play a role in regulating the marketplace under federal supervision. That law laid the groundwork for the vast over-the-counter market that grew into NASDAQ. Bankruptcy practices were reformed too, and trustees handling other people's money were given clearer rules to follow. The climax of Douglas's tenure at the SEC came in March 1938, when Richard Whitney, the old guard's champion, was exposed as an embezzler. 
News of his crimes stunned the exchange. Whitney made a quick, quiet, guilty plea and headed off to prison, but Bill Douglas astutely used the shocking case to expose how poorly the NYSE had policed itself, how frequently Whitney's cronies had looked the other way and ignored glaring warning signs. At public hearings, Douglas even revealed that Whitney's brother at J.P. Morgan and another top Morgan partner had known for months that Whitney was a crook. Indeed, in November 1937, they had secretly loaned him a million dollars to cover up an earlier theft. The Whitney hearings, which still make for riveting reading today, show the nation that Wall Street, with its clubby culture and self-serving code of silence, could never be trusted to police itself without federal supervision. And nothing we've seen since 1938 has changed that verdict. In mid-1939, FDR named Douglas to the Supreme Court, but the spade work Douglas had done during his SEC tender tenure produced further reforms. In 1940, Roosevelt signed the 40 Acts, the twin laws that regulated the mutual fund industry, the final piece of FDR's campaign to put Main Street on an equal footing with Wall Street. Well-regulated mutual funds would democratize the American market beyond anything Dick Whitney could have imagined. From his earliest stump speeches to the advent of World War II, Franklin Roosevelt had put financial regulation as the heart and soul of his New Deal for the American people. He saw regulation as the only way to save Wall Street from itself. He believed that a fairer, more humane capitalism was the only ideology that could protect the nation from the growing threats of communism and fascism. Roosevelt was determined to create an America, a strongly democratic America, where Wall Street served the country's needs and not vice versa. And for a time, against all odds and with the help of extraordinary allies, he did exactly that. I hope that Taming the Street will remind us how much we owe to the New Deal and how important it is that we res preserve FDR's legacy so that the cop on Wall Street continues that work that Roosevelt so wisely began. Thank you for your patience, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Diana. Thank you for that wonderful uh, summary of a very long and detailed history. Uh, let, me, let me start with the first question, which is from William Pinsler, uh, who's saying, Diana, in this book, you are more outspoken than you have ever been in print about the need for strong enforcement and regulation. Over the course of your career and all five books, has your view changed? And if so, in what way? Thank you for that question, Bill. Um, my prior books uh, were focused more on debates about how to regulate Wall Street, how to regulate mutual funds in Fidelity's world corporate takeovers in the White Sharks of Wall Street, um, derivatives in the, my book on the 1987 crash. Um, but that debate about how to regulate Wall Street today has been replaced by a debate about whether to regulate Wall Street. And I have very clear feelings about that and, have, and always have. I never thought I would actually be having a serious conversation with serious, important, and powerful people about whether to regulate financial markets. To me, it's like asking whether we should regulate traffic. You know, let's take down all the stop signs, all the speed limits. And say, are you crazy? So yes, Bill, I I felt I'd earned the right after 50 years in this business to to say what I think, and what I think is that. Financial regulation is essential to maintaining public support for our democratic capitalistic form of government. A, a well-regulated economy will build public support for a democratic society, in my belief. 
And so that's why I came through a little more passionately than I have in the past. And again, we encourage the audience to send in your questions. Uh, this is a little bit of an anti because we think we know where you're going. But, you know, in the past week, Charles Gasparino had an article out with a very inflammatory headline, something along the lines of the SEC, you know, the SEC is turning into a banana republic. Uh, have we gone too far? How do you feel about that? Oh, we haven't. No, we haven't gone too far. That's the short answer. We haven't gotten even close to the kind of aggressive regulation that Bill Douglas believed in, that Franklin Roosevelt believed in. So, no, we have not gone too far. I, I do agree in one regard with, with Charlie, and he and I disagree about a great many things, but I do agree with, with in one regard, which is that um, our regulatory system has become rusted and barnacled and hampered and, and cumbersome over the years and needs a thorough modernization. Uh, that I think we would both agree on. But the current aggression that Charlie sees is to my mind, a regulatory agency doing exactly what it was set up to do, what Roosevelt expected it to do. Thank you. Let me let me go to the second question. This is from my colleague from the museum, Christine Aguilera, who's asking, is financial reform still necessary? I think you may have answered that already to some extent, but that's the question. Is it still necessary? Well, I, I think it is, Christian, and not only financial uh, regulation, but a more modern approach to financial regulation. I mean, when Roosevelt came to office, there was no cop on Wall Street. You know, it was it was running like a you know a, a criminal gangland. When Roosevelt left office, there was a primary cop on on Wall Street, the Securities and Exchange Commission. Today, we've got uh, you know Treasury agents, we've got FSOC agents, we've got commodity markets agents, we've got maybe too many different kinds of cops on Wall Street, all competing for jurisdiction and, and fighting over who should be policing that strip of the street. After all of our modern market crises from 1987, 2008, to the post the pandemic crisis, we have emerged with a clear consensus among those who studied those crises that our regulatory system today has become fragmented and balkanized and that no agency has the kind of 360 degree vision and the kind of 360 degree authority that is required to cope with modern finance in which we no longer have separate markets for derivatives, for options, for stocks, for commodities, for bonds. We have one big market, all the same players, all moving money back and forth out of these markets at lightning speed. So not only do we still need financial regulation, we need to streamline the financial regulation that we have so that it is broader uh, and better able to cope with the single marketplace that we now have to cope with as, as regulators. So um, I don't think the work is anywhere close to done We've let too many decades go by without modernizing our regulatory system. And it's time we got that work done. Uh, Marty Fritzen, uh, you may know him, uh, trustee of the museum, as well as well-known Wall Streeter. Uh, FDR personally opposed federal deposit insurance, believing it would create moral hazard. And he says that's a fear that was vindicated massively in the SNL crisis several decades later. So as part of the political horse trading, FDR agreed to include deposit insurance in his financial reform package. The question is, was there any way that this unfortunate compromise could have been avoided? And he added a little footnote that privately managed bank clearinghouses at the state level previously succeeded in preventing bank panics and FDIC put an end to those as well. Well, good to know that you're watching, Marty. I'm a, we, Marty and I go way, way back. Um, I studied the state level insurance plans. None of them were still in existence at the time of the end of the Great Depression. All of them had failed. So it's not necessarily accurate that the FDIC put them out of business. They put themselves out of business. Uh, it is true, as Marty says, that, that Franklin Roosevelt initially was opposed to the idea of FDIC uh, coverage. Uh, it was Herbert Stiegel 
the congressman uh, who insisted on it and was able to, he gambled correctly that Roosevelt would compromise on that rather than risk losing his, his precious banking bill, which became the Glass-Steagall Act. Um, I think that you need, everyone should, should orient themselves to what the world looked like when Roosevelt made that compromise. I disagree with Marty that it was ill-advised. <clears throat> Banks had failed at the rate of more than three a day in the years prior to Roosevelt uh, coming to office. And when banks failed in those days, 99 times out of 100, investors were at risk of losing all their money. Billions of dollars in family nest eggs had been wiped out by these bank failures all through the 1920s. Uh, it, it, it was a disastrous time to try to save one of the most poignant things I saw, and my book doesn't have illustrations, sadly, so I couldn't reproduce it, but there's a, a wonderful editorial cartoon that ran at the depths of the Depression early in 1933. And it showed a, a, a bedraggled, uh, careworn man sitting on a park bench with worn shoes and patches on his coat. And the thrifty little squirrel in the grass is saying, well, why didn't you save if for a rainy day when times were good. The guy's holding a newspaper in his hand that says bank failures. And he tells the squirrel, I did, I did save. And my savings were wiped out by the bank failures. So in the context of what America had lived through up until the point of night, that, that compromise in 1933, bank deposit insurance was a critical piece of restoring public confidence in the banking system, without which they were not going to get those banks reopened and they were not going to be able to keep them open. So that's the historical context in which FDR made that, uh, made that compromise with Stiegel. Uh, I frankly still think it was a wise one. I disagree with the assessment over what the roots of the SNL crisis were. I do not believe it was the moral hazard that arose from deposit insurance. Um, in, indeed, um, I think if we look back just to the recent history of last year, when we had several major banks fail, Silicon Valley Bank, First Republic Bank, and Signature Bank failed, I was on social media every day looking at younger people in my field, younger financial writers and, and younger people in general saying, oh my God, am I going to lose my money? Do I need to take my money out of the bank? And I'm just frantically typing away saying, no, 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 no. We have FDIC. FDIC insurance. Don't panic. It will be fine. Shareholders will get hurt. They should get hurt. They were responsible for this irresponsible management. But depositors up to the limit of FDI insurance will be fine. And we didn't have a bank panic. If we had not had FDIC insurance, we probably would have. So you know, while economists can argue moral hazard, I argue public confidence. And it's a lot harder to regain public confidence when you lose it than we ever thought it would be. Roosevelt taught us that. Here's a question from Tom Herman. Uh, Diana, you mentioned that journalists were bribed. Would you please give us some examples? Oh, my word. One of the most embarrassing passages I had to write. There's a, there were wonderful hearings held in, in Congress. Um, and Fiorel LaGuardia, who we all remember, New Yorker area, remember him as this irrepressible mayor of New York for whom our airport is named. Fiorello LaGuardia at the time was a congressman and he rep represented a district in, in Manhattan. And he had come across evidence of um, a bag man in Manhattan whose job it was to go around and pay the bribes to the journalists who were being paid by the pool operators, the market manipulators, to write puffy little pieces about stocks that those pool operators were ready to dump on the public. These were the pump and dump schemes of the day. Um, I'm embarrassed to admit that some of these journalists were stupid enough to take the money in checks. 
And LaGuardia marched into Congress with the canceled checks in a huge trunk full of records and exposed them. And these were financial writers at some of the leading newspapers in the city, uh, some of the, the best known and best followed. Um, unsurprisingly, it didn't get a lot of attention in the daily newspapers. There was one big front page story and then editors just decided, well, let's move on, nothing to see here. But I can say as a, as a proud member of the Society of American Business Editors and Writers, as it was uh, then known, that incident, the exposure of that uh, bribery, that dishonesty, was the lit the fuse that led to higher ethical standards across my profession uh, from that day uh, moving forward. Codes of ethics that govern uh, journalists specifically forbid that kind of behavior as, as they tried to regain the public's trust. So yeah, it, it happened. There's no argument that it happened. If you go to the, um, the PCORA hearings, all of the names are spread out there the exhibits, the canceled checks, you just can't believe it. We don't know who was bribed. I mean, the smart journalists got bribed with cash and we have no record of that. But, so we only know about the dumb ones who, who, took, uh, who took checks that could, be, that could be traced. But certainly not my profession's finest hour, but an extremely instructive moment for my profession. And one that I think led us to a much higher plane of ethical behavior. Uh, Professor Richard Silla, well known to our audiences, former chair, current member of our board. I'm a, I'm a huge fan, <laughs> Professor. He wants to know, which is a great one, what do you think about proposals about bringing back Glass-Steagall? Oh, you know, it's interesting. Um, the parallel, and Dick will know this uh, completely, the parallel between what happened to the Glass-Steagall prohibition and um, what happened to the... Uh, Attorney General's opinion and the Solicitor General opinion that came out under President Taft that forbade banks to enter the securities business at all is very similar. In 1911, under President Taft, uh, a ruling was issued. The AG's office and the Solicitor General said, you know, banks cannot deal in securities, period, full stop, can't do it. Well, banks ignored that decision and slowly crept, tiptoed into the securities business. Um, and before you know it, they were such big players in the securities business that there was nothing Congress could do but enact a law that gave them permission to do what they had been doing for nearly a decade by then. Well, the same thing kind of happened to Glass-Steagall. By the time it was finally repealed, it was virtually a dead letter. It had been nibbled away by Edge Act corporations, by uh, Federal uh, Reserve rulings, by Treasury Department decisions that had allowed what none of us thought was legal to happen legally until finally it was blessed officially. So it, it's interesting that, that, that I think it, this proves the proof of that old adage, it's, it's better to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission. That's what the banking industry did. It asked for, for, for forgiveness instead of permission. But um, as to the calls for bringing it back, um, that's one of those examples, Dick, where I think we're being unrealistic about how, how far we can dial the, the, the history wheel back. Um, this is a little like the people in FDR's age, um, like Louis Brandeis, the, the Brandeisians who believed that Big business was the problem, not bad business, but big business. And that the best way to produce a healthier economy was to shrink big business into little businesses, small businesses like there had been in the in the 1900s, in the 1800s, rather. And that that would solve the problems that that had emerged in the first quarter of the 20th century. Um, Roosevelt didn't buy that. And neither did Joe Kennedy. As, and many of Roosevelt's advi advisors, like uh, uh, Adolph Burley and, uh, and Ray Moley, they believed that bad business was bad business. It didn't matter if it was big or little. Attack bad business because big business was inevitable. America was becoming a global superpower after World War I. There was no way you could put that genie back in the bottle 
and turn America back into the small town, small company economy that it had been back in those pleasant romantic days of old. So Roosevelt was determined to build a regulatory system for the way the world was then, and that's the way the world is now. So I think it's, it's just as difficult for us to go back to the days when the institutions that served our financial needs were tucked into nice little silos that allowed us to say, you can do this, but you can't do that. We need to be realistic about how much we can change the embedded infrastructure we've inherited. I would rather see better regulated bank holding companies and, and investment bank holding companies rather than a, a return to Glass-Steagall. But um, it, that's a long-winded way of saying, no, I don't think we're going to get Glass-Steagall back, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. So in that uh, spirit of moving away from a small town economy to a global economy, here's a question from Lawrence Rosenberg. What do you think of Jamie Dimon's criticisms of U.S. global bank regulation? Is there fairness to his views or is he more talking his book? <laughs> well, he's certainly talking his book. That doesn't mean he's wrong, uh, but that's what he's paid to do. Um, the, the global ba banking uh, regulation, as well as global market regulation, is exactly what I'm talking about, Lawrence, when I'm talking about the desperate need to modernize the financial regulatory system that we have. It no longer stops at our shores. Um, the EU's rules no longer stop at the Atlantic Ocean. Um, the way Asia works no longer stops at the Pacific shores. We have to work more cooperatively with regulators around the world uh, to address the fact that we have a global banking system. We have global markets. The 1987 crash was perhaps the, the first real wake-up call that we had that you know markets, stocks trade all around the world through the time zones and come back round. We're not our own little island anymore. Um, if you look at one of the most compelling problems of potential regulation that we face right now in the cryptocurrency field, that's a global market. It will only be resolved through a global compact. I think one of the biggest deficits I've seen in the U.S. regulatory uh, machinery in the, in the decades since, well, really since the 1970s, has been a lack of attention to international cooperation. Now, under David Ruder, there was certainly an effort to expand international understanding, uh, to, you know, to reach compacts and agreements about listing standards, accounting standards, basic nuts and bolts, things like that. But in more recent years, um, we just have not seen the aggressive White House-sponsored negotiations that would allow our financial regulators and foreign financial regulators to work more closely. Uh, so that's just one of many examples uh, of how we've we've let our financial machinery um, fall so far behind our financial realities. So, uh, that's um, it is a challenge. Mr. Diamond is not wrong that the that the U.S. Uh, is perhaps misguided in how it approaches global banking. Um, I'm not sure his solutions are all correct, but I do agree that this is a global problem. It's, a, it's a, a problem that we have to address globally or can't address at all. So you just touched upon this, but it was the next question from Professor uh, Jim Kelly, uh, our friend. So um, how do you recommend anything else you want to say about crypto, about uh, regulating crypto? And then we might as well get your overall opinion. Any parallels in history you see to crypto period you might be hey. looking at? Hey, listen, if, if you like the way crypto is regulated, you would have loved the 1920s. Um, I mean, that's what an unregulated market looks like. Um, you know, routinely manipulated prices, thin trading volume, huge whales that move through and have an incredible price um, price impacts, opaque markets, no idea who is out there trading what and at what price, um, riddled with fraud, riddled with deceptive uh, sales materials, promises about protection for your uh, uh, for your assets that are not there. Um, welcome to the 1920s. 
that that's what all of Wall Street looked like before Roosevelt's reforms. Uh, so if you if you like that, you're going to be real happy with crypto. Um, whether or not crypto should be regulated or how it should be regulated, I have to admit I have moved. Um, I, I've changed my mind on this several times. My initial response, my re initial reaction was, where are American regulators? Um, as the crypto industry is hijacking the vocabulary of American regulation. I mean, if, if you're letting an unlicensed trading platform call itself an exchange, then that's on you, Mr. Regulator. In our country, an exchange is a regulated entity. It falls under the 34 Act. And to allow people to hijack that word and say, eh, we're an exchange, it drove me crazy. I was screaming at the television commercials back and forth. No, you're not an exchange. They even refer to, to people's you know, loans to, in cryptocurrency as deposits. Oh, not deposits, not deposits. So my initial idea was just take the language back, make them call themselves what they really are. And maybe that will deter retail investors from rushing in foolishly and squandering their money. That train left the station. <laughs> there was nothing that we could do. That was already done. Um, and then we got to the point where the, the fraud was, was tumbling along so rapidly, I began to worry that if you tried to regulate, if, if, um, if regulators kind of put their imprimatur on this market, saying, okay, we're going to regulate crypto, it would just attract more retail investors in without really having the capacity to protect them. So I felt like you should hang a sign on the crypto market saying, unregulated, abandon all hope, ye who enter here. If you get into trouble, you're on your own. Uh, and make it clear that this is an unregulated market. Don't come in here unless you're ready to lose all your money. Well, and then retail investors, good Lord. My nephew's son in college was, was playing around with crypto and I got on the phone with him and said, you know, listen, you gotta listen to me about this. You gotta, you gotta stop. Um, it became impossible to hold back um, the retail investor. Celebrity endorsements, all kinds of uh, glittery coverage, fairly uh, credulous media, I have to admit, uh, made this like catnip to younger investors. And at the point where you have that degree of retail involvement in a market, I'm afraid regulators have no choice but to follow in, to go in. Um, it, there's no way you can, uh, you can uh, barb wire it off. There's no way you can keep people out of the crypto market. Um, we've tried that in other areas. We've had the idea of the qualified investors. You have to have certain standards before you can trade options, or you have to meet certain criteria before you can invest in hedge funds. That might be a way, that might be an approach, but the courts are already active in this area and, and we're gonna have to live with the decisions, good, bad, and terrible that are coming out of that litigation process. So yes, I think American regulators in concert with global regulators are gonna have to ultimately regulate this field of, uh, of I don't even call it investment, this field of financial activity. David, do I have time for one last question? Oh, yeah. well, I'm going to squeeze one in here. All uh, right. This, this one is from Vladimir Augustine. Uh, did your research provide any insights over how FDR handled the social pressures and presumably emotional pressures of knowing that if his presidency failed, that his would be the last presidency. And can I just add uh, any re lessons relevant for the upcoming election then to tie into that? Oh, yes. Well, quickly, Roosevelt could not be made afraid. He was the, one of the bravest people who's probably ever served in that office. This is a man who um, at age 39 was stricken with polio and had to salvage his entire life and career by brute strength. There was nothing that the world could throw at Roosevelt that could scare him. He was also a man of very simple but very profound religious faith. 
And I think he believed that he had been put in that office to do a job and that the divine providence would help him do it. Um, so uh, that's how Roosevelt coped. And it's, a, it's an incredibly inspiring story to see. Um, how we cope today, well, as David reminded me, you know, I, I do want to say that um, financial regulation is as much on the ballot next year as our strength of our democratic institutions is on the ballot. Um, our financial, our regulatory machine is facing uh, judicial assault, it's facing attacks in the courts, it's facing attacks in Congress, and this is when we need to elect people who will defend it, improve it, Yes, but who will defend it? Um, and so I, I hope that learning more about this heritage that we got from the New Deal will educate voters, citizens, and investors uh, about how precious it is and how important it is that we save it. I think we are coming up on the hour, so uh, I'm sure we could have gone on for another 30 minutes or so, but uh, we, have to, we have to conclude here. And let me conclude by thanking everyone. And let me remind everyone that next week, Thursday, at the same time, we have Joe Calandro, who will speak about credit cycles. And Joe is a fellow of the Gabelli Center. So with that, uh, thanks again, and all the best to everyone. Thank you, Diana. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.